Hey, this is Tom and in this video I wanted to introduce an interesting workout design that might just represent a more effective way of increasing your VO2 max or aerobic capacity as a cyclist, but also as a runner, cross-country skier, rower or any other endurance athlete. This is a type of workout that we've been using for a while now with the cyclists that we coach through our performance consultancy and it's been showing some really good results in terms of driving up that aerobic capacity, which is something that pretty much every endurance athlete should be looking to do. So what I'll do is firstly briefly explain what VO2 max or aerobic capacity actually means for a bit of context. And then we'll analyze the actual workout design that I'm referring to in depth to show how it can help to increase the amount of time you can spend in the target intensity range that's necessary to best stimulate those large improvements in the oxygen uptake. Let's get started then and understand exactly what we're referring to when we talk about VO2 max. All right, to start with, the VO2 max, as many of you probably already know, is the maximal amount of oxygen that you can take in, deliver to the working muscles, and then use for energy production during high intensity exercise. Breaking this down, the V stands for volume, the O2 for oxygen, and the max part for, you guessed it, maximal. You'll see similar terms used in other areas of training and performance, such as VLA max, where the O2 or oxygen part here is simply replaced with LA, which refers to lactate, to represent the maximum lactate building rate, which is something we'll talk about in a future video. Whether your VO2 max is estimated from power data using a program like WKO5, from lactate data with something like INSIDE, or via direct measurement in a cardiopulmonary exercise test, your maximal oxygen uptake or aerobic capacity can be expressed as both a relative and absolute result, e.g. 85 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute, or perhaps 4.4 liters of oxygen per minute respectively. As a little side note, these results might more accurately be described as VO2 peak, since your maximal oxygen uptake might not be elicited in a single test or even in training. Now the process of this oxygen actually reaching the muscles to be used for energy production involves several steps, which include, in simple terms, it being taken in from the atmosphere and entering the lungs, the passage of oxygen from the lungs into the blood, that blood being pumped by the heart to the working muscles, and then the oxygen being transported from the blood to the mitochondria, the little power producing organelles within the muscle cells via the capillaries. Without going into too much detail, research suggests that the greatest adaptations and improvements to an athlete's VO2 max will come from the heart's role in this process, the strength of which can be measured by cardiac output. Now there are two key parts to the cardiac output equation. The first is heart rate measured in BPM or beats per minute. And the second is what's called stroke volume, i.e. the volume of blood that's pumped with each beat from the left ventricle. Looking at these two factors and with an understanding that heart rate won't change greatly through training, it becomes very clear that the largest opportunity to improve your VO2 max centers around improving this stroke volume of the heart. This is key as it allows us to start from the ground up when designing workouts ideally suited to improve this important component of fitness. So now that we know that the stroke volume component of cardiac output is vitally important and that cardiac output overall represents the greatest opportunity for improvements in the oxygen uptake, that leads us to the question of what we should do in training to most optimally improve the stroke volume. So let's take a look at that now. There are two main objectives we'll want to achieve for an effective VO2 max workout to be executed. The first is to reach a high heart rate, meaning upwards of 90 to 95 plus percent of heart rate max, which will push the heart muscle to contract at a maximal force, driving a high stretching and elastic recoil. And secondly, we want to achieve a considerable accumulated training time in this elevated heart rate range in order to provide a large stimulus for adaptation. It's no good going as hard as possible and only spending mere seconds in this high heart rate range. Taking all these considerations into account, let's take a look at an optimized workout that can help us achieve these objectives to maximize the adaptive response and adequate strain. Here you'll see that the interval blocks look a little different from what you might be used to, 
especially for those intended to target VO2 max improvements, where something like this is much more common. To start off with, we have a basic warm-up period as with most workouts. And this can be somewhat short, i.e. 10 to 15 minutes, or perhaps 30 to 40 minutes plus if these intervals are to be integrated within a longer session. This warm-up can be just some steady riding or include a short effort at the power output anticipated for the main work intervals. The idea is then that we want to execute some work intervals that are far longer than we'd usually use for this purpose, where we found with our clients that six to eight minutes and about three to five repetitions is tolerable and effective. The intervals want to start off with a super threshold effort designed to raise the heart rate quickly, where these will usually be at or above the intensity common for VO2 max work, e.g. 120 to 130% of lactate threshold power, or FTP. After about 60 to 100 seconds, you should find that the heart rate under normal, decently rested circumstances will rise up into this target 90 to 95% of heart rate max range. At this point, the power is then brought down to a much more comfortable intensity, typically at or just below the lactate threshold or FTP. This provides a rapid relief to the muscles and a ceasing of quick lactate accumulation, but won't bring the heart rate down as quickly. Instead, the heart rate should remain elevated for a decent amount of time whilst the power stays low. It's worth noting that the blocks in the structured workout on screen are just there for illustrative purposes and exact intensity should be manipulated in real time for each individual. Once the heart rate begins to drop towards 90% of heart rate max, the power is then brought back up to elicit a corresponding response in the heart rate and get it back into this range. In this way, the power output is varied to keep the primary metric which is heart rate at the most optimal level. This pattern of varying the power continues throughout the work interval until the predetermined duration is complete. After the interval set is finished, the same thing as the warm up generally applies, where you can use a short cool down if the overall workout is compact, i.e., if you're on an indoor trainer, or the ride can be drawn out for an hour or more if the intervals are part of a longer session. Finally, let's discuss some tips and suggestions to help you to perform these workouts as best as possible. As with any new workout, it's best to start out conservatively with regards to the duration of the work intervals and the amount of repetitions that you aim to complete, where using a range will give you some good leeway. Next, ensuring that you come into such a workout with a decent amount of acute freshness will be helpful, especially from the point of view of having the heart rate be responsive which is typically an indication that the muscles aren't suffering from the kind of localized damage or fatigue that can stop you being able to push hard enough to generate the necessary high heart rate values. Next, we find the best terrain for these intervals when performed outdoors is on a sustained climb with a mild gradient that's enough to give you something to push against, yet not steep enough to prevent you from dropping the power sufficiently when you need to do. Alternatively, flat terrain can also work, especially if this is more specific to your typical racing domain. For example, if your training is geared towards flatter races or for time trials. For those interested, you may find the sustainability of the VO2 Max paper by Veronique Billard, which is linked below in the description, to be some intriguing further reading on the results of applying this heart rate first approach to training the aerobic capacity. In summary then, compared to shorter intervals using a fixed power output associated with your VO2 max, such as those derived from training zones calculated from an FTP test, these variable power intervals may help you to accumulate a far greater amount of time in the target heart rate zone that's ideal for stimulating these adaptations in cardiac output. So hopefully this short video has given you a few ideas and a new perspective on how to look at improving your aerobic capacity, which again is one of the cornerstones of endurance performance. If you've got any questions at all, then please leave them in the comments section below the video and check the description box for some extra training resources from myself and Dr. Emma Wilkins. So until next time, good luck with your training and I'll catch you on another video soon.